Welcome to the November meeting of AHSA Queensland. Uh, we've got a guest tonight, Jenny Morgan, a friend of Dennis Baker. The Caboolture Aero Club's Open Hangers Day on the Saturday 13th was a great success. Uh, despite being a windy day, it was, uh, there were dozens of interesting aircraft owned by Caboolture Aero Club members, including many vintage and veteran aircraft, which call Caboolture home, and including Ross's We're Away. Um, the Tavis didn't have their aircraft out because it was so windy, but they did have their hangar open for inspection. And the HSAQ had a small display at the clubhouse there. We made ourselves known to potential members and sold some books, magazines, etc. Several members, Malcolm Philpot, Dennis Anderson, Ann McDonnell, Prue Mason and Ray Villeman members were there in attendance with me. Tonight, as well as having members and guests here participating, we're again Zooming so that our AHSA colleagues in this country and interstate can join us. And our guest speaker tonight is Ross Parker, owner pilot of Wirraway A2695 VHMPW. And he'll be telling us about the Wirraway, an Aussie icon. And Ross's Wirraway was one of the aircraft to see at Padilt Caboolture. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome our guest, Ross Parker. Thanks, Warwick. And greetings to everyone here at Archerfield tonight and around the country. Uh, thanks for the opportunity to present the Wirraway to you tonight. Uh, I can tell you I've operated the Wirraway, this particular one, for over 20 years. I have somewhat of a love affair with her, I must say. It's strange because, as um, some of the audience that I know, you go back to when we were young pilots, we wanted to go everywhere uh, at 100 miles an hour with our hair on fire. And now I'm chugging around the countryside at a stately two miles a minute. But eventually, I think the Wirraway uh, to my friends and family became synonymous with me and I became synonymous with the Wirraway. The Wirraway itself is actually enjoying a resurgence in popularity uh, as we see at uh, my company, Warplanes Proprietary Limited. Um, I think that that's because the community is becoming more and more aware of our history, particularly our military history. Uh, the internet has probably got a lot to do with that, but we're seeing more people at Anzac Day parades. Uh, there's increasing interest in things of that nature. And years ago, uh, as I would take the Wirraway to various air shows, people would be hard pressed to tell me what it was. They'd have a guess and sometimes they'd be close, but rarely <laughs> would they be accurate. But these days, it's rare that someone doesn't know what it is. And indeed, we operate adventure flights with the aircraft, so the public can go, go flying. And most of our passengers these days have act, act, actively sought out the Wirraway because of its historic and heritage value. Over the years, I've had the pleasure to meet uh, many of our veteran pilots who flew the Wirraway during World War II and uh, listen to their fascinating stories. Some of them had me in stitches, others were uh, intriguing and some rather frightening. I've had some of those brave pilots walk around the aircraft, uh, look at it ca carefully, and some of them have actually sat in the cockpit if they were mobile enough. And I can tell you on many occasions, there's been tears uh, as they take themselves back in time, which you can do in this aircraft today. However, I think sometimes I wonder whether they've remembered uh, what a handful it was to fly. <laughs> Uh, I'm a pilot, as you know, uh, but I'm not a great historian, which may seem a little ironic. Here I am pre presenting an aircraft to a historic society. So if you notice any errors in my presentation tonight, here or uh, at home, uh, please let them go through to the keeper and bring them up at the end of the presentation. I'm happy to discuss them. I apologize in advance for any errors that might be there, uh, as my presentation has come from many sources. And I also apologize for the quality of my PowerPoint skills. But here we are. And I know there are, there are a lot of people out there who know a lot about this airplane and it's really encouraging. And there are, there are groups uh, such as uh, the CAC We're Away Friends administered by people such as uh, Derek Buckmaster. So I commend them for their contributions and uh, interest in the We're Away. But uh, in, in terms of a presentation tonight, I'm all you've got. I invite you to treat the presentation as uh, somewhat of an informal discussion. And at the end of it all, uh, I'll take as many questions as you want to answer and I'll do my best to find a, a good answer. 
I've got some articles of interest that you find on your chairs. You can pass those around. And uh, later on, as we get towards the end, I've actually got the original logbook for A2695, which was born in uh, January in 1945. So we can flick through this carefully, if you don't mind, and find some interesting in entries. And part of the joy of reading a document like this, apart from its heritage, is just looking at the writing there. Everybody could write, and neatly. Uh, so this details the birth of the airplane, its uh, service, and I'll talk a little bit more in the presentation about the history of this particular airframe. There we have Beauty and the Beast, I suppose. Um, and we'll talk more about my association with Wirraways as we go into the presentation. So basically, who am I? Why am I here? Why do you have to put up with me tonight? Uh, I started off uh, my career in the Air Force, the RAAF, just a country boy from New South Wales and uh, joined the Air Force Academy in 1973. As fate would have it, I have one of the senior cadets in the audience this evening from the Air Force Academy. Mal Herman puts up his hand. <laughs> and that was on number 26 course. In those days, in our second year of the Academy, we did uh, some flying and we did the, the full 25 hours uh, that is normally done in the pilot's course. That in my case was done on the windshield. And as we know, as most of you will probably know, the windshield was actually the aircraft, the, the primary trainer that pretty much took over from the Wirraway. So that was my introduction to flying, went solo in uh, early 1974. And I might say that the windshield itself scared the hell out of me. It was a, a big machine that made a lot of noise and it had your respect from day one, uh, as did the military instructors, I can assure you. Uh, at, the, at the end of the academy course, we did our, our full uh, pilots course. I was on 101 pilots course, graduated at the end of 1977, headed off to uh, do four years operational flying on caribou aircraft. And one sits at Caboolture at the, as we speak that I used to fly as well. Uh, to finish off my career in the Air Force, I did six years flying the, the BAC-111 at Canberra, and then finally onto the Boeing, uh, the Boeing 707 uh, to see my time out before I headed off to uh, commercial flying. There's a picture of a very handsome chap. I can't even recognize him these days. He's a lot thinner and got a lot more hair uh, flying the Mackie there. Uh, commercial Airlines. I joined Cathay Pacific Airways in 1986. And after 10 years on the 747, all types up until then, not the 400. Uh, I then spent 21 years on the Boeing 777, uh, 200, 300, and the big 300ER, which went globally for seven, eight, 9,000 miles, 17 hours. You get a few sleeps along the way, but as you can see, uh, it's Boeing, Boeing, Boeing. And just a little comment on Airbus at the end there. Have we got that, Peter? Does everybody see the PowerPoint? Good, thank you very much. I just wanted to, to all my Airbus friends out there, I just wanted to <laughs> rub that in again. Warbird experience, how did I get into this? Um, about 1992 or, or so, 93, I was taken to Caboolture by one of the, the, the owners of Sandora Aviation, who was restoring uh, what is flown now as A2176, uh, which is actually 81, and operated by Paul Bennett in Cessnock. Uh, we went for a quick fly in that, and he managed to sign me up to a syndicate that uh, was called Warplanes, well, it was called Mustang Fighter Trust at the time, where we restored 695. Again, I'll chat a little bit more about that shortly. But the idea was to create a syndicate with a P-51. And as you will know, in those days during the, the war, the Wirraway was basically the advanced trainer. You would probably do um, five, 10 hours or so on a tiger moth or something smaller. And then you'd uh, be flung into the Wirraway to have the daylight scared out of you on that thing for uh, the rest of your pilot training. Uh, so we restored a, a Wirraway, which again, I'll tell you about, and, uh, and a Mustang. So they were together and uh, right now, 
that syndicate has gone in two different directions. The Wirraway is owned only by myself and one other person who is actually a, a pilot here at uh, Archerfield, Steve Boyd. He flies out of a, a fighter pilot here in an L-39. And I would like to uh, give my commendation to Steve. He's a wonderful partner and he uh, contributes to the, to the fantastic condition that we managed to keep uh, 695 in. I'm also the owner of a T28B uh, aircraft known as Miss Stress, and you can find that on the internet all over the place. And that is also, we also do uh, adventure flights in that through Warplanes Pride Limited. Uh, and to round off my word, Warbed experience, I am a display pilot uh, for air shows. We do commemorative fly paths such as ANDAC days and anything else that uh, is of a commemorative nature. And uh, we operate adventure flights, as I said. To round it off, yeah, 48 years and 25,000 hours. So I'm just about getting it right. But uh, all good pilots will say they never do that. They never get it completely right, so you don't relax. Okay, there's the baby that uh, we have. Pity the weather's not so good, otherwise we could have had a, a floodlit walk around her tonight, but uh, on another occasion, perhaps. But anyone who comes to Caboolture, uh, I'll make sure my contact details are available for you here, and please look me up, give me a call, and if I'm on the field, then you're all welcome to a personalised tour of the two aircraft. Uh, I am also the president of the Caboolture Warplane Museum, so we can take you through the museum as well. So there are things to see up there. Okay, what is the Wirraway and why are we here tonight? Well, it's a venerable old machine. It's, uh, it has such a reputation now and a resurgence in popularity. Most of you will know, of course, the word Wirraway means challenge in Aboriginal. And I can assure you, it is every bit of a challenge. Uh, I've said down the bottom there that it's easy to fly badly and hard to fly well. It is an airplane that will catch you out eventually, uh, particularly in gusting winds or crosswinds. The landing phase is probably the most difficult, uh, but it, essentially it is the World War II training aircraft that was also assigned a combat role. I cannot imagine what it would be like with a CO coming in and telling you to get airborne against the Japanese. Um, and uh, we, we lost a lot of them. Uh, right, it's a low wing monoplane. It's, uh, it's a, a derivation of the NA-16, which we'll touch on a little bit later, which is a North American design. Uh, but we, it was pretty much the first of those derivations. So it's got a fabric fuselage and fabric flight controls. Whereas uh, the, the other iterations of, uh, that we'll talk about later uh, had a metal fuselage. It has an air-cooled nine-cylinder radial engine. Uh, made by Pratt & Whitney. Well, the engine was designed by Pratt & Whitney. And in fact, we produced them under license uh, in, here in Australia at Commonwealth Aircraft Corporation. And it was the advanced trainer that after you left the Wirraway, you went to bigger and better things, uh, often with people shooting at you. So in the beginning, how was the Wirraway born? In the mid 1930s, um, after the war to end all wars, it was evident that the storm clouds for war were building in Europe. And for some reason, we had a government with a bit of vision. That was a long time ago. Uh, and they realized that there was a problem, there was a building need for uh, a an Australian aircraft production capability because they pretty much knew that as if conflict did arise, then we would not be able to source aircraft of our own. Our fleets at the time in training and operationally were becoming quite obsolete. Most of them were biplanes and uh, British built that were obsolete pretty much out of the factory, but that's another story. Uh, so in 1936, the government dispatched a team to go around the world, particularly to uh, Europe, UK uh, and the US, to find a new trainer. And they, that team was led by Wing Commander Lawrence Wackett, uh, who was later to run Commonwealth Aircraft Corporation. They 
visited all those countries and looked at many different types. And in the end, uh, they decided on a type uh, made by North American. And you'll, that's North American Inc, like Proprietary Limited. And that was, that's the company in, indeed, if, you, if you're not familiar, that then went on to make Mustang. And indeed, in my case, it went on to make the Trojan, the T28. So they came back with the NA16 model. It was pretty rudimentary at that stage, but it, it was the basic uh, design that we know that became the Wiraway. Uh, well, first of all, the, everybody was shocked here because it wasn't British. And there was a huge expectation of the, uh, of the team to come back with a British selection. Uh, they failed to do that, but after a lot of research and a lot of uh, inspection, they realized that this was the new way to go. It was a good uh, basic design. And they looked at it in terms of the, the ability of the Commonwealth Aircraft Corporation just being formed to actually produce it. And they realized that uh, it was easy to produce. It was within the capabilities. So in the end, uh, they had no choice, uh, really. So the Wiraway uh, was born out of a, a, a modification, a, a deriva derivation of the NA-16. Now, the NA-16 basically was an aircraft that, that pretty much never flew. Well, it, it, it flew, but it was never a, uh, it, it was never in production. It was never a production version. Uh, they made two types of NA-16s uh, that had different, uh, you've got down, in uh, September 1937, uh, one was an NA-16-1-alpha, which had fixed undercarriage. We've got some pictures coming up. Uh, and the other one was an NA-16-2-kilo. Um, and it was the two-kilo derivation that uh, we became the Wiraway. And for those aficionados, as I understand it, because the Wiraway was pretty much the first of these types uh, to be produced, that's, that's why the NA-16 had a, a, a rounded fin at the back. And then later on, they realized in other production models, such as T6s and Harvards and whatever, you didn't need all that rudder area. So that's why there's a, a slight difference in the, in the rudders. And it's one of the ways you would pick, pick a wear away at a distance. Uh, so in 1937, the licenses for uh, the production of the aircraft and the Pratt & Whitney engines at CAC were issued. And finally, in September 37, uh, the retractable undercarriage NA-16 2K flew. It, an interesting thing about the serial numbers, both of these aircraft were then modified to become Wiraways. And it was some years ago now, I was speaking to one of our, uh, uh, the guys who, uh, Ed Field, hello Ed, if you're watching, uh, who was uh, a director of Sandora, the engineering company that was restoring 695. And uh, I wondered why the serial number, I'm giving this away, by the way, why the serial number for the aircraft was 693. Because I hadn't put two and two together or taken two away from 695, because that's what happened. They started the serial numbers from original Wiraways. So if you look in the registration uh, documents, the CASA registration documents for these aircraft, they're all two less than the number that was on the site because these two were created, or they were made into Wiraways. And 29th of March, uh, the first delivery of uh, the Wiraway aircraft to the military and pr production, uh, so production began. So there's a picture of the early NA-16 with the fixed undercarriage. Doesn't look that attractive, does it? It's, uh, it sort of sticks out. And you can see on the tail A20-1. Now, that's, now they shipped them out. They came out on a, on a ship and put them together. And they used those as a, a training aircraft to work out how to build one of these things. Big Meccano set, I guess. Speaking of Meccano sets, uh, that's what it looks like. I've got a, another picture here of a, a side cutaway that you might like to pass around. And that'll give you some idea of, of the complexity of the tubing and the airframe and some of the systems, which are pretty simple. And there they are, uh, working away on those aircraft. All right, the Wiraway aircraft. Here are some statistics. Uh, we'll blind you with stati statistics. Uh, wingspan is important, I can tell you, partly because 
it's, it's not a very efficient wing, but it's a big wing. And we'll talk about how well it glides a little bit later because there is a story that I can relate to its glide performance, which is not bad. Uh, 43 feet, 13 meters is interesting because uh, finding a hangar for these things is not easy. Most of the hangars around uh, the air, airfields these days are 15 meters, but that's wall to wall. So finding one with enough space to actually push the airplane straight in is almost impossible by the time you've got doors and various other things. Uh, but it lives in a 20 meter hangar, so I can show you. The wing area, uh, that's just a number, but the wing area for an inefficient wing, as Mal will know, is so important about keeping these things uh, airborne. Uh, it's about 1800 kilos, empty weight and uh, 695 is 27, 2800 kilos uh, all up. Uh, interesting, uh, it, it's such an aeroplane that you, you pretty much cannot load it out of balance. So you can put uh, anybody in the back seat and it's provided they fit. And there's a little baggage compartment behind where you can put uh, at least 50 kilos of that and it's still well within all weight and balance limitations. So it's a very flexible aircraft in, in, that, in, the, in those terms. Uh, the engine, uh, and it's, it, this is different to the other types that have been built. It's uh, a 1340S1H1G. Uh, it's a nine cylinder air-cooled radial for 600 horsepower. And uh, this is a geared engine. And you'll note when you see pictures of, of the aircraft that there is a, a, a gearbox just behind the propeller. And that's a reduction gearbox that reduces the, uh, the, the speed of the propeller uh, to two thirds of the crankshaft. Um, as far as I'm concerned, that does the airplane a favor, um, as opposed to the two bladed props, which spin faster off the crankshaft for Harvard's T6s and the like, uh, and which have uh, a rather uh, characteristic note, shall we say, on the takeoff. Uh, some would call it deafening. Uh, but the good old we're away with a slightly different exhaust system and the three bladed propeller spinning slower sounds more like. Uh, your average V8 coming down the road. So uh, it's interesting when the, a formation of these go past, then you'll, you'll be able to spot the wear away from a sound point of view. Well, they did turn some of them into fighters and bombers. As I said, the mind boggles as to uh, how some of these young fellas felt when they had to take these aircraft up against uh, the Japanese. Now that's not to say that the wear away doesn't fly well, it does, uh, but it's not as maneuverable. It wasn't designed to be. It's not as powerful and it, has a, a, it doesn't have such a great power to weight ratio because it wasn't designed to. They're up against Japanese fighters, some made of wood, they're certainly light, they were nimble and they had bigger, more powerful engines. So uh, it, was, it wasn't an afterthought but it was something that the, the government had to do because they, again, they didn't have enough of these, uh, uh, enough fighters and bombers. They had to use something. So what they did was mount, uh, initially they mounted uh, two 303 machine guns. And again, when you look at the, a picture of a we away, you'll see a couple of blisters out the front of the cockpit. Uh, and that's where the machine guns were mounted. And in fact, later on, we'll show you a picture of 176 uh, which has the, the, the full armament, uh, certainly external armament um, of the, the guns there and a, a, a flexible, rot they had a rotating seat in the back and they had a, a machine gun uh, on, a, on a mount there. So we're gonna hope that the machine gun, the forward firing machine guns actually had their right, the right gearing so that the, the bullets would go through the, uh, between the blades and not through the blades. And the same in the, in the rear cockpit so that the guy didn't get uh, carried away and shoot the tail off. Um, later versions went for, for browning machine guns, but that's a bit of a detail. Uh, and they, they did put some under the, under the wings, but not very many. It could carry bombs uh, and a couple of shots you'll see later. There are some bomb racks under the aircraft, but again, it wasn't a lot. So they could carry two 500 pounders, which was pretty significant really. Uh, for an aeroplane of this size, uh, uh, they could carry, um, 
most of all, they were carrying practice bombs or flares that would uh, locate uh, the enemy in the, in the forest or so. Military service operations. I'm not, there's a lot of information out there uh, for the service detail of the squadrons that the, air, the aircraft flew in. I'm not going to go into that detail now. Suffice to say, there were nine different squadrons, uh, and most of them were seeing action. Uh, th there were training units and, and flying schools, because that was its primary role, obviously, and, and they were scattered all over the East Coast um, from Victoria to Northern Queensland. The Royal Australian Navy uh, had two squadrons operating whereaways as well. And it turns out that the RAF indeed had one unit operating them. Uh, they got some aircraft from 21 Squadron and operated those in Malaya for a couple of years. And the US Army Air Force also had a couple, the headquarters unit, unit was uh, probably operating them in the, the transport role. It could have been SIRS aircraft or uh, just the, 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 the squadron hack to get them around from one base to another, where they certainly weren't operational. Uh, there we have, uh, I, I love these guys. Uh, the, the, the guy in the front's got no helmet, got, got no earphones, no nothing. There he is, probably having a wonderful time, but wouldn't be, he, he's, he would have been deaf as a post by the time the war finished, that's for sure. And, and here you'll see actually, so this is a, uh, one of the combat ones. You'll see the guns sticking out there from that forward port. Uh, you'll note that in, the, in these aircraft, uh, they haven't got the rear machine gun put in this one, but they removed the back shell uh, for the cockpit, uh, for the canopy there. So these guys were always in the elements. And underneath, you'll also see that some of the bomb racks there where they carried those small bombs. There's another picture of 695. Uh, some would say it looks like a model, but uh, that was actually taken from a helicopter down in, Car uh, down in Cowra by one of our friendly photographers, Darren Crick. So uh, I, I have to admit there'll be a fair bit of 695 for you tonight. But um, uh, it's the closest one I had to take pictures of. Equivalent aircraft we've covered uh, a little bit of. The USAF ordered many thousand uh, T-6 Texans. <laughs> The US Navy operated the SNJ. I'll put a plug in for Texan Proprietary Limited, uh, who operate an SNJ out of Caboolture. Uh, it's based and housed in the Caboolture Warplane Museum, and that is also available for adventure flights. Indeed, if you're lucky or you get a couple of mates together, we take the SNJ and the Wirraway flying in formation. So that's uh, a little gem for some of our passengers when they choose to do that. And the Commonwealth countries uh, all produced and operated the Harvards. There we have a picture of early models. We have uh, 11, four, and I think it's 10 or something in the background. So they're all Mark Ones. Uh, I haven't mentioned that uh, as the production series went on, they produced three different Marks. The roles in theaters, what they do? Well, it was a general purpose uh, and it operated in combat and GP role in, in nine squadrons. Trainers all over the East Coast. And I've been to a lot of bases, a lot of airfields such as Tokemoor uh, and the like. Uh, and they were at Wagga and Urin Quinty, uh, many sort of famous training bases during the war. After, the, after their military service, oh, not to mention that they were very instrumental in the early days of uh, the Pacific War, particularly 1942. Uh, they were very busy and probably one of the uh, most disappointing performances or uh, one of the most tragic was uh, in the defence of Rabaul, where many aircraft were lost. In, in fact, almost all of them uh, and many of the crew were lost as well. After the military service, uh, they were sold to civilian operators. Um, some of them didn't even operate airplanes. They were sold as scrap uh, a lot of them uh, had suffered irreparable damage and uh, were, they were either scrapped or uh, just left to rot in uh, farmer's paddocks, a few in the barns that were found later. So they disappeared into all sorts of uh, different places, but very, very few of them flew after the war. Uh, there's uh, just another random picture of one of the, it's, four, it's 
four nine it's four nine eight yeah and again the gun is not fitted that i can see in the back but uh okay we'll talk a little bit about uh radial engines i don't want to tell you how to build one but it is obviously core to the operation of the wear away now anyone who's flown radial engines will understand that it is so crucial uh, they're tough uh, and even in these days there was a lot of knowledge of metallurgy so they knew what all the metals in this engine would do they knew the the capability of every part in the engine but one of the most crucial things about operating a radial engine in this case it's it's air cool that's a uh, it, that's a twin row i think no uh, anyway one of the most important things is that they're operated within strict temperature and pressure limitations so when you start them up you have to let them warm up and now indeed on a lot of uh, aircraft like we we retrofit uh, a, a, a pre-oiler system to make sure that we get enough oil into that crucial part of the engine operation which is the startup so they must be operated under strict temperature and pressure limitations and again not only the flying of, the, of an airplane like this the operation of an engine like this must have been fairly daunting to uh, some of these young pilots who probably were unlikely to have ever had a driver's license i guess they rode bicycles but uh, to to go very quickly to operating a 600 horsepower engine with a tailwheel that was trying to send you uh, all around in circles must have been a real challenge. I remember my windshield days. It was a challenge then. Also, uh, with these sort of engines, you've got carburetor icing issues and all the training that was done down in the Victorian area, uh, you could quite easily have power loss, some minor, some significant. Uh, and I'm sure that things like carburetor icing led to the loss of many uh, of these aircraft in those days. There is a website that most of you will be familiar with, and that's ADF Serials. It's a very well put together website, and I commend it to you after the, uh, the meeting here when you're home in, with a spare moment. Have a look at that and go through the, uh, I think it's series two of the, uh, the aircraft there for the RAAF, and it has uh, an amazing record of the Wiraway and their fate. It's always curious to me as to why so many of these aircraft crashed. ADF Serials points out that there are a lot of engine failures in, uh, in, in the, led to the crashes. Well, um, to some extent, I dispute that the engines, I can't believe the engines just failed. Um, and again, I'll talk about my experience of, we say power loss. But uh, I can't believe that they just failed because they are robust engines. But a lot of the flying that was done in those days uh, was, particularly in the training role, was by young pilots. They were young instructors and they were very young uh, students. So I've got no doubt, and I'll talk a little bit later about the ergonomics of the cockpit. I've got no doubt that the ergonomics of the cockpit, uh, the general handling of the airplane, its handling characteristics, and engine handling played a huge role and environmental, we talk about, uh, about carburetor icing and the like, that they all played a role in the loss of a lot of these aircraft. Where today with uh, different education and different training, hopefully we wouldn't lose as many. And a lot of lives were lost. There are only three Wiraways flying in Australia, airworthy ones. There are a number in projects at the moment. And I commend all those people for getting involved in that. And I wish them all the very best to get those projects underway and into the sky as soon as possible. But uh, apart from 695 at Caborja, that's the only Queensland one. We have uh, A2081, which is painted as 176 in the camouflage with the guns and everything. And that's operated by Paul Bennett at Cessnock. And we have, uh, 653 is the aircraft operated by the Tamora Museum. There is one other. So I'm always careful when they say how many aircraft fly. I said there is one other hiding away in Florida because the, uh, Kermit Weeks, a collector of just about everything with wings, I think, 
at uh, the Fantasy of Flight in Florida has A2704. Uh, he's also has a, a boomerang under restoration at Caboolture as we speak. And there's actually a, a YouTube video of Kermit visiting Caboolture and talking to uh, Matt Denning, one of our, the guy who's restoring these boomerangs. Uh, it goes for quite some time. There's a couple of those videos. They're quite interesting as they talk about the boomerangs and whirlways and, and such. There's also a, a video on YouTube of Kermit taking, uh, at least starting up the wear-away. I don't think it's a flight, but so you can check that out. Uh, two recent re retirements, we're talking recently, the last few years, uh, was 652. That went to the Queensland Air Museum in Caloundra. And that is still there and it does engine runs. It doesn't fly. And that was part of an agreement for it to go to the Caloundra Museum. And 722, restored lovingly by Borg Sorensen, in Melbourne, and that now resides in the NIL Aviation Museum. A couple of years ago, I got to visit NIL and perform in an air show there, and I saw 722. And if anyone's out that way, it is immaculate. Well done, Borg. And there's a picture of 652 on its final flight, escorted into Caloundra by 695, with my buddy Steve Boyd at the controls of 695. That's over the Pumice Stone Passage there at Caboolture. There's a few pictures for you. Um, those two pictures of 695 are out at Watts Bridge uh, during formation training with the Red Radial Group. And there's a, a lovely picture of 176, uh, it's 17681, I keep flopping because it's really 81 painted up as seven, 176. And there you'll see the, uh, the radio mast, uh, the guns in the front, and the rear gun in the back cockpit there. I can also tell you, I don't know if Paul's watching, when, you, when you're flying this aircraft, it's very breezy because the gun ports are not sealed. And he did get me to ferry this all the way from uh, Ely Beach, nice and warm and tropical, to Tokemwall in the winter, thank you. So it was fairly breezy, uh, but it's a lovely machine and he looks after that very well. I might just point out one little thing here. When people talk about the flaps, this is what's called split flaps. They, they split from the, uh, from the underside of the wing there. The, yeah, they, they don't provide much lift, I can tell you, in that, in that landing position, but they do stop the airplane. And there is a picture of 653. The one, uh, it's an older picture, not long after it started flying out of the Tamora Aviation Museum on gear retraction. We'll tell you about 695 since I haven't mentioned it very much. Well, there's only three of them, so really. Uh, 695 was delivered to the Air Force in uh, February 1945. And as I said, please take a look at the logbook later on. It, it's interesting reading. Uh, and really, as the war was starting to wind down, in, it wasn't long to finish in Europe uh, and the Pacific War uh, was turning in the favor of the Allies at the time. So this aircraft really didn't have a great demand upon it. So it flew through until the end of 45, 46 or so. And from then on, it seemed to be spasmodically in and out of uh, storage because they still had all, a, a fair few wearaways, but the demand for pilot training was much less, of course. So it did its last flight in 1957. And when it finished, there we are. 597 airframe hours. And I can tell you, we talked about owned by numerous people until 1993, none of those people restored it or flew it. So in 1993, when it started its restoration, it didn't even have 600 hours on it. So here we have, down, oh, down the bottom, I'll tell you that. It's 77 years old and it's got 1500 hours on it. It's a baby. Uh, it was restored by Sandora Aviation, who are no longer operating, but uh, they restored 176, as I said, and then 695, and then the P-51 Mustang known as Snifter, which is no longer at Caboolture. It is headed down to, uh, well, it's currently still in South Australia, but after its uh, repairs, it will go to be based in Cessnock. Uh, so I doubt we'll see it much up here. Uh, it's the first test flight of this aircraft was in 1997. 9th of July, and we'll talk about that a little bit later, I think. 
and uh, it's owned and operated by our company, Warplanes Proprietary. And I'll also give a plug for Cameron Rolf Smith, who operates uh, and owns and operates Performance Aero here on the field at Archerfield, and he does a marvelous job of looking after that for us. So there we go. That's six ninety five. That's not six nine five. Why not? Yeah. I, I don't know if he's really going for a flight. He still left, left his bags down there. But <laughs> uh, you might, if anyone's interested in the, the, the minute detail, uh, for certainly uh, 70, 176 and 695, uh, they have Mustang wheels and brakes fitted to them. So they're not perfect. Uh, well, they're, they're not perfectly historic uh, because the Mustang wheels and brakes are more powerful and they uh, are better performing than the original Wiraway stuff. The original Wiraway tires mostly with these um, uh, ones with a big cross tread on them for operating on all sorts of fields, but uh, the Mustang wheels and brakes work much better. First flight, uh, March 1939, and then production ceased, interestingly, on the 9th of July 1946. So it was actually 51 years later that 69 flew, 695 flew to the day. Interesting. It's, it's not part of my script, but I'll tell you a, a short story about th that test flight. I was taking a friend of mine flying 695 at Cessnock. Her father had been a Spitfire pilot. Uh, he was long deceased, and, but her mother lived in Perth. And as we drove to the airport to go flying, she gave me a photograph and said, here, what do you think about that? It was 695. Well, nothing that special, really. I know that airplane. And turned it over and it said 9th of July, test flight. So it was taken, obviously, from another aircraft, airborne. I said, it, she said that was in my mother's uh, a dressing table or something in Perth. And mum was about 91 at this stage. So how does this photograph get to Perth and then come back to me? Turns out that she had a, a, a fellow friend in those days. And this guy, strangely enough, had actually been in the back seat of 176 when they did the formation for a test flight, which is very common. And he took the photograph and later on gave it to this person's mother. And he would have not known that she was the mother of this person who was going flying in the wheelway. <laughs> Weird stuff. Meant to be, I suppose. Uh, okay, the, as I said, there's countless uh, people who were trained on this airplane, both as, as pilots, but also gunners and observers, and we, we can't forget them. Uh, we've talked about ADF serials, and we've talked a lot about uh, engine failures, crash landings, coll collisions, and other mishaps. Um, certainly, the number of um, fatalities and casualties in training far exceeded the number in combat. A fairly tragic thing, but uh, I suppose it was necessary. Uh, so actually the, reading the ADF serials, so some of it is a, a bit of a giggle to find out that uh, there, there must have been a lot of airplanes upside down and sort of around about uh, and, and damaged, but also sadly, there were a lot of casualties. Uh, some people managed to recover aircraft under you know, really adverse conditions, get them on the ground somehow, whether it, whether it was in a paddock or not, uh, and, and, and did that well and everyone survived. Other people had simple emergencies and simple crash landings or simple, um, I don't know, engine out uh, emergency situation, and yet simple from a handling point of view, and yet everyone died. So it makes sobering reading that, uh, that website and just reminds you of the uh, the respect that you must show this airplane. Some stories, okay. We talked about the gliding capability of the aircraft. Um, on a pretty poor weather day after an air show in, in 2011, uh, I was operating the 695 to bring her home to Caboolture. And uh, as I'm climbing through about 5,000 feet on my way back, so I'm approaching about eight, eight and a half miles or so away from the field. And let's say I had a power loss. It's a big power loss. Uh, some would call it an engine failure, but I'll call it a, a power loss. And after thinking, well, this is, if I, if I pray to God, he'll let me know that this was carburetor icing and with a bit of heat, this will all go away and I'll be fine. Uh, well, he didn't answer the call. 
And uh, I soon realized that this was only providing air conditioning. That was all. And apart from wanting to jump off the engine mounts, it was doing nothing else. So I turned around and looking for a field, not much out there at that time. And the weather wasn't that helpful either. Uh, but I did have a helpful tailwind and I managed to glide over eight miles back to the airfield and hit all of the points, high key, low key, uh, and easily made it into the airfield from over eight miles away. And that included the U-turn. It did have a, a, a hefty tailwind, but that'll give you some idea of the gliding performance of the airplane. It really is quite a good glider. Uh, and I'll relate one other story told to me by one of the veterans. Um, the guys used to do <clears throat> night flying in the Wirraway. I don't think I can think of much anything much scarier than that. But uh, yeah, they were doing their night flying training in night Navex. And they were operating out of one of the uh, fields down uh, in Victoria, I think. And they took off on a triangular navigation exercise. And in those days, they would install an instructor at one of the turning points uh, or at each of the two turning points. And they would count the aircraft as they went over. And to be sure that there was the right aircraft, they would uh, get every aircraft to fire a flare as they went over that. And so they go one, two, three, okay, all, all the little ducklings are on their way. And they got very worried when in fact, they were one short at the second turning point. And so a lot of scurrying around, a lot of messages and Lord knows how they were contacting one another in those days, but certainly there was great consternation. They were one short, what has happened to the aircraft? Not long later, the errant aircraft landed at the base there. And they couldn't work out what had happened there until when he taxied in, opened the cockpit, and he looked a little bit like Al Jolson. <laughs> <laughs> this guy had managed to fire his flare as required, but forgot to open the can of heat. <laughs> now, as far as I'm concerned, having flown this airplane for a long time, he needed to get some sort of award because I cannot imagine the illumination inside the cockpit of an airplane like this because it's so small this thing would have been bouncing around everywhere it must have been a million candle power and he would have been blinded for the next 20 minutes how he managed to get the airplane back on the ground and not crash it immediately is beyond me so we had a good uh, a good laugh about that <laughs> he also pointed out to me because i didn't know at the time that there was this is many years ago there is a thing called the we're away song now, you can all actually find this on YouTube if you plug it in, and I'm not going to sing it for you, but it's all done. Actually, I, I, have, I have got a guitar. My, my kids will tell you that. But I will read some of it to you, uh, and it's, it's really quite interesting. And, and apparently everyone knew this song, and it's to the tune of, you know, bless them all, bless them all. And it's, they say there's a we're away out on the line, all set for a country flight. Hydraulics leaking and missing its revs, it's hoping to get there all right. There's many a cylinder running a temp, having no oil on its wall, with good navigation and much concentration. You'll get there and back, bless them all. The chorus, the chorus then goes, bless them all, bless them all, from Darwin right up to Rabol. Bless the instructors who taught us to fly. Bless the CO and the old CFI. So we're saying goodbye to them all. Let Wirras and Wagga recall. The scenes of emotion when we get promotion. So cheer up, my lads, bless them all. Oh, yeah, then, oh, we're always don't worry me. We're always don't worry me. Oil bowing bastards with flaps in their wings and buggered up spark plugs and buggered up rings. So we're all saying goodbye to them all as back to their hangars they crawl. They'll only, there'll be only elation and wild celebration. So we say goodbye to them all. And finally, the last verse is, they, they say that the Japs have some very nice kites. Now we are no longer in doubt. So if a zero gets on your tail, this is how to get out. Be cheerful, be careful, be calm and sedate. Don't let your British blood boil. <laughs> and don't hesitate, shove it right through the gate and blind the poor bastard in oil. <laughs> there we go. That's the Wirraway song, and now we'll talk about one of the famous flights in a Wirraway uh, by flying officer Jack Archer.
on the 26th of December. Uh, I wonder if he'd had a, a good Christmas day. 1942, flying with number four squadron. Uh, he's patrolling uh, up around uh, Indonesia and he spots so-called zero about a thousand feet below. He must have crept up on him. I think the Japanese guy must have been asleep, but he had one opportunity and fighter pilots will tell you, you take every opportunity when it's there staring you in the face and he opened fire on this guy and shot him down. Now the message went back to Canberra and they didn't believe it. No, this cannot happen. A Wiraway cannot shoot down what was in, at, the, at the time considered to be uh, a zero. In fact, it was a Hayabusa, which is an Akajima Ki-43. Uh, and that's still no shake, no mean shakes of an airplane. Uh, but it was, sorry? Is that an Oscar? Yes. Uh, Oscar, yeah. And it was still a, a good shot. Uh, in fact, Archer was renowned. He, he was, he was uh, categorized as above average in those sort of skills. So he did a really good job. Uh, and he was actually awarded the Silver Star, the American Silver Star for that. MacArthur authorized it and, but it, and it was pinned on him by some other general in, uh, in, in the, the country at the time. The only Australian built aircraft to shoot down an enemy aircraft. Now this is important, ladies and gentlemen. And I wish Matt Denning was watching because I remind boomerang pilots <laughs> from time to time that that was a purpose built fighter and failed to shoot down any enemy aircraft. It might have shot down a couple of its own, I don't know, but uh, the Wiraway, there we go. The Wiraway uh, has one kill to its name. And I think this might have been one of the chaps that he uh, was up against. Tell me what you think. <laughs> Can you all read that? Rare photo of Japanese longest serving kamikaze pilot, the sixth mission veteran chicken teriyaki. <laughs> there we go. He's happy about that. And 695 over Kabulcha again. Oh, so yeah, enjoy that. Lovely blue skies, not like today. And it is enjoying a resurgence in people coming flying with us, I can assure you. And for those uh, who are going to be in the region next year, don't forget the Brisbane Air Show about 2nd and 3rd of July. All these aircraft will be there. And Paul will be bringing 176 up, I'm sure. Maybe tomorrow will bring theirs, but um, there we go. Maybe that was the guy going on the night navigation exercise. That was a, I haven't got the after shot, I've only got the before. <laughs> Flying a Wiraway. Would you like to know a bit about? Right. Uh, the pre flight. Uh, it's pretty straightforward for radial engine uh, of its time. And we're just going to check for damage. We're going to check for uh, proper operation of the flight controls. Uh, we will do a, a, an operation of the, the flaps on the hydraulics uh, with a hand pump. It has a, a, a backup hydraulic uh, hand pump. And we will uh, pull the propeller through nine blades to lubricate the engine and also check for a hydraulic block in case there's any oil down in the bottom cylinders of the radial engine. Uh, then we get in. And the startup is, um, it can be tricky because you've got to have the right balance. It, it's got, a, its choke is actually a primer, old fashioned primer, Kai gas primer that you give about nine strokes on a cold day uh, and then uh, try and get this thing going. It's, it's really sensitive to throttle position like a lot of these old air engines are. So if you've, got, if you've got it too wide open, it'll backfire. If it's not wide open enough, it'll struggle to actually uh, to get into life. But once it's running, you leave it alone for a while to get some of that oil warmed up and ready for taxi. Uh, we then also do a, 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 we check the operation of the flaps on the, uh, the engine driven hydraulic pump. We'll then go down to uh, an area for uh, the run up. All this is very standard, so please forgive me if I'm boring you, but uh, there's, nothing, there's nothing extraordinary about the run up uh, procedures in this airplane. Most importantly, temperatures and pressures. So once you've got those uh, ready to go, uh, you can start your run up and we're just gonna check uh, magnetos. We're gonna do a power check. We're gonna check 
the uh, operation of the carburetor uh, air, make sure we're getting warm air in case we get icing, uh, and the like. So that's a pretty standard bunch of checks. You'll notice when we're always on Spitfire's taxi, I'm preaching to the converted, I'm sure, they always look like uh, the pilot's had a few to drink because he's never going in a straight line. And I can assure you, you can see uh, pretty much nothing out the front of them. Uh, line up for takeoff, uh, it has a, uh, a steerable tail wheel within a, a, a probably about uh, 10 to 20 degrees, that's all. Uh, you can use that on the rudders. And once you go past that, we, we taxi with the, uh, the tail wheel unlocked, but it will actually stay within about 20 degrees while you're taxiing until you take a, a, a wider turn, either when the wind blows you or you actually use differential braking and it will then turn into a fully castering tail wheel, which again, uh, unlike the windshield, for example, which has a, a lock and unlock, but it, it, when it gets back within that zone, it will get back into the steering mode. And then on, so on the lineup for takeoff, we simply lock the tail wheel so it won't go spinning all around on our takeoff or indeed on our landing, and off we go. Uh, we don't use full power in the aeroplane. We use probably about 85 to 90%. There's a gate, and that's more than enough for the airfields that we operate out of. So we're never really using the 600 horsepower, and we think that will give us uh, a longer engine life. We talk, I'll just jump to the, to the next section of this slide, which is uh, the, the circuit workload. Okay, I'll just talk about this for a moment, because this will give you some idea, uh, and so will that picture that I've passed around of the complexity of tubing and piping. And over this side of the airplane, it is somewhat of uh, an ergonomic nightmare. So I'll, de I'll describe the operation of the hydraulics for you. Well, first of all, we get airborne. Now, here is the throttle quadrant with throttle uh, mixture and the propeller down there. You'll get a, start to get an idea that you've got a lot of knobs there and they're all starting to look the same, aren't they? And down here, there's your trims. And, and, and just back here, I'm, oh, there they are. These two levers, flap and gear. What a perfect place to put them <laughs> next to one another so that something can go wrong there and it has on many occasions. So with the hydraulic system, to reduce or to increase the life of the, the, the engine driven hydraulic pump, it is not always under pressure. And here uh, we have, this is called a power valve. Now, when this is engaged, when it's pushed in, it will port hydraulic pressure into the systems. And the hydraulics are only used for extension of the flap or retraction as well, I suppose. But they will blow up, but not all the way. But they'll certainly be used for the retraction of the undercarriage. So we, we've got to retract the undercarriage, but the system is only idling with zero pressure when we do the takeoff because this valve is out because we don't want hydraulic pressure on. Once we get airborne, you can put this lever, which that one there is the undercarriage lever, you can put that back into the retracted position. All right, so then what will happen? Absolutely nothing. Yes. So while you're busy flying, supposedly you've got your hands on the, the throttle and you, you've the steering with the, with the yoke there, then um, you've actually got to push this plunger in. Some people can use their elbow or you just take your hand off the throttle and push it in. And then these telltales down here, will those two on the right are the gear indicators. And when, when the gear is up, uh, there is uh, a little lever we pull across there to uh, and d disregard that. And uh, we will then pull out the valve because we've taken off with the flaps up and we'll depressurize the system. Okay, so, so far so good. We're airborne, flaps are up, gear is up and off we go. Let's talk about then going into the circuit. So we're gonna do some training. So we're gonna fly downwind and the, uh, the aircraft is gonna be clean. We're gonna fly with the canopy open. We always do our circuits, takeoffs and landings with the canopy open in case there is a rollover. There is a rollover truss, uh, which I should have pointed out in another slide, uh, between the two pilots. So you are safe from the rollover, but the canopies are not uh, really strong. They're not really robust and it wouldn't be too difficult to actually twist the, uh, the, the framework. 
and then you might be left in a burning wreck, not, not being able to get out. Uh, so we're taking off, the, the canopy's open, and we're downwind, everything's right, we're going to lower the gear. That's simple, gear down, breaks the, the up locks, and the gear will fall down. Now comes the tricky bit. We've got to, we've got to use the flaps. Uh, so passing a beam the threshold or thereabouts, we're going to put, uh, we've got, well, first of all, we have to decide now, are we going to do a full stop landing or are we going to do uh, touch and go? So if we don't do touch and go, we've, we've decided as a procedure, we only use half flap. And the good thing about that is the half flap has a lot less drag and it has a very, very small difference in stalling speed. So for all intents and purposes, we can fly the airplane exactly the same. Uh, it just doesn't have all that drag so that when we do the touch and go, we don't have to worry about, this is our procedures, we don't have to worry about pulling up the wrong lever because we don't touch any levers until we're airborne. And then we pull up the gear and then the flap. All right. So if we're going to do a touch and go, we will put down the flap to half. Now, the flap itself, that lever there, it, it is in a, it, that's a lock position. That is up and that is down. So you fly around in the lock position and we want to put the flap down. So we put the, the lever down. So what happens? Nothing. Nothing. Because there's, there's no hydraulics in there. So now, because we, we haven't used the hydraulics to put the gear down, now we have to uh, engage the hydraulics, push in the hydraulic valve. So now the flaps start to run. Then what happens? Well, they go all the way down if you don't stop them because it, it, it doesn't take any notice of, well, it knows that you've put the flaps down. So you've got to then uh, pull that back against hydraulic pressure to the lock position. Okay, now you're going to do a touch and go, well, you can pull the valve out. If you're not going to do a touch and go, you've got to leave it in because you've got to get more flap and you need, because uh, as you're coming around base, you're on finals, I need the rest of the flap. If you have pulled this, this uh, plunger out uh, and you push the lever to down, anybody guess what happened? They go all the way up again. Oh, you guys are cheating. You've read the manual. Uh, so yes, they go up. So there you are, half flap. Everything's look, looking great on finals. And suddenly you've lost all of your, your lift and the proverbial ass starts falling out of the airplane. Uh, so, and that's not a pretty thing at that point in time. So the operation of this valve and the, the flaps really are uh, an ergonomic nightmare because you're, you're between these two levers, you're back up on the power. Uh, and it, if you don't sequence all this stuff at the right amount of time, then you can get into a bit of bother. And the place you can get into the most bother is not on finals when the flaps come up, uh, but is if you do a missed approach. Okay, so you've somehow got to get the flap traveling up. But if you pull it out of lock and leave it out of lock, they blow up because there's no hydraulic pressure to leave them where they are. So you lose pretty much all of your flaps in one go. And you still got your gear hanging out. So this is not a pretty sight, I can tell you. Uh, so you have to squeeze that, that flap lever just out of the lock. So you can feel the flaps just starting to blow up a little bit. And then as soon as you, you get them, this is if you've got full flap, you've got to quickly put it back into lock because you don't want it all to go up right now. Put that there. Ah. Oh. Now you can maybe pull the gear up and push in the plunger to get your hydraulic pressure back. And eventually you can think about uh, pulling up the rest of the flap. Okay, so the hydraulics are in, the gear is up, you've got half flap down and you pull the, the lever up. Well, it doesn't work because you've got hydraulic pressure in there and you can't get that flap up. So you once again have to depressurize, <laughs> pull the plunger out, depressurize the system put the flap in the up position and push the plunger in again because you need it to properly tuck the flap all the way up because it often doesn't blow all the way up. And then finally, then you've got to put it back to lock and finally you can pull out the plunger again. So, an engineer for sure. <laughs> but I want you to think about this um, in terms of what we were talking about before, which is the, uh, the accident rate. Now I started to come to fly this airplane when I probably had 15,000 hours and I trained on a radial engine and a tailwheel aircraft uh, and still it was a challenge. And I wouldn't like to buy a beer for every time I got the sequence all wrong uh, and had to castigate myself. But uh, it, it's the sort of airplane that these errors will occur. It doesn't matter who flies it. Even 
even to this day, that there can still be the odd time when, oh, no, should have done that one first. So it is such a challenge. Thank you, we're away. Uh, and it is a machine that will always keep you honest and you've got to get up early in the morning to be on top of it. On top of that, if you have gusting winds uh, in the circuit, uh, once you put the airplane on the ground, uh, we do what we call wheeler landings. And I think most people do uh, because you've got a slightly higher speed and you can pin the airplane on the main gear onto the runway. And once you've done that, you can, if you, you've got a nice long runway, you can just let the, the, the speed wash off itself. And as that happens, you're losing rudder control. You're losing a bit of rudder control, but you're losing elevator control. And actually the tail just settles nicely onto the ground. But ladies and gentlemen, that's where the fun begins in these aeroplanes. Because you've got a, the tail on the ground, you've lost your rudder control because uh, you, you, ha you haven't got enough steering at the moment. It's not really that effective. Uh, you haven't got enough airspeed over the rudder to make too much difference in directional control. You're losing your elevator control as well. And arguably, as, as the, 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 the wings develop this higher angle of attack, you're losing control of your aileron. So uh, you're losing all of the flight control effectiveness, shall we say. So you then there's a transition between you're still flying the airplane in that early phase of the tail going on the ground, but then there's a transition between you can't fly it anymore, you've got to drive it to some extent. Uh, so then you've got to use brakes to, for directional control. Now, there is no such thing as anti-skid <coughs> and uh, it's differential braking. And it, the braking system has its own hydraulics and its own uh, system uh, to itself, but the brakes, particularly the Mustang wheels and brakes, very powerful, very effective. So it doesn't take much more than a, 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 a slight bit of uh, a slight bit of too much pressure on one uh, brake pedal th that shouldn't be there and you will be around in circles in the ground loop. Uh, and when, it's, it's always interesting, and there's a couple of YouTube things that, that show uh, me landing 695 in Evan's head, and you can see the rudder is going furiously as I'm trying to keep directional control of the aircraft um, because they have a big sea breeze that comes in at Evan's head at about two o'clock in the afternoon and it can, it can provide a huge crosswind. So yeah, watch the rudders when you see uh, we're always landing and you'll, the, the, the guy that is not moving his rudders like that, um, well, one day he'll come a cropper. So there you go. That's some uh, idea on the challenges of flying this damn thing um, in the circuit or otherwise. And by all means, ask me some questions about that later on. And I've, I've got more than a story for you. It's just another picture of the rudimentary. Uh, that's actually 695. Uh, so you'll see there's no testament to any modern facilities in there whatsoever. We do mount a, a, a small GPS unit up there, uh, but otherwise the cockpit is pretty much the same as it was in those days. And you'll see there's no floor in the airplane. So when we take people flying, if they drop their phone, that's it. <laughs> it, it stays there. Another shot of uh, one of the later models. Now, this is supposed to be a video as well. Yeah, don't, don't ah, this one's working. Can we turn the sound up? Uh, no, I can't. So this, this is the SNJ I was mentioning before. Uh, they're both based at the Caboolture Warplane Museum, which is in the background. And this is a day when two lucky adventure flight people go out for a formation uh, jaunt. It's a pity we haven't got the, the noise there because, and certainly there's another video after this one, which will give you a, an idea of the different sounds of, the, of these airplanes. The SNJ actually has a, uh, that, that particular model has a, a geared propeller and a three bladed propeller, unusually, uh, because they were flying them off carriers. So there's only 11 inches of clearance from the bottom of the blade on, a, uh, on 695. Uh, so you can't throw that at a carrier deck because uh, you'll put the propeller into it. So they shortened the blade on the SNJ. But to do that, if you shorten the blade, you're losing some thrust and some lift. So they had to put another blade on it. So there they go. Another Air Force Academy guy flying the SNJ, I can tell you. That's Dave Crow, Mal. Dave. Off they go. 
and they do a lot of the Anzac Day flying for the region north of Brisbane there. Okay, thank you, boys. So in a nutshell, it is one of the most iconic aircraft of World War II in terms of the Royal Australian Air Force and our military pilots who went to serve uh, in combat. It certainly has an important place in the history of the Air Force. And we've got, as I mentioned, several projects underway at the moment. I wish them well. And hopefully we'll get more of them into the skies. Um, interestingly, it, it's not a, uh, an airframe uh, hour limited aircraft. So provided the condition of the airplane is uh, adequate, then it can fly on and on. And they fly in the limited category which is overseen by the Australian Warbirds Association from an engineering point of view. So everything is reported to them, including the appointment of the engineers who look after them. So they have to be specially qualified and endorsed by the Australian Warbirds Association. And let's hope that there's uh, many more of them in the skies to come. Okay, a little plug for uh, our company. Uh, I should have, I meant to bring some of those brochures, but. Uh, it's all available online. So if you or any of your friends uh, wish to take flight in these airplanes, they are available at the drop of a hat, I would say. Uh, the shot on the right, I can say, uh, there are still people who appreciate history, and that is the second landing ever after a Spitfire on runway 01 left at Brisbane, the, the new runway. So after this, we had a, a Spitfire, a Mustang, an L-39 and the uh, Wirraway all in a line, having been the first aeroplanes to land on that runway. Oh, there you go. Yeah. <laughs> well, to be, to, to be honest, uh, they didn't all land on that runway. I think the L-39 landed on the other runway and taxied over, something like that. But anyway. For those watching on Zoom who might miss that, Bob Livingston just said, I organised it all for the Brisbane Airport Corporation. So there we go. There's one of the loving shots from our photographers. I hope you've enjoyed that presentation and I will invite questions. Oh, Ross, I recall days at CAC uh, when we were talking about fitting of wedges on the leading edge of the wind jewel and the wear away. What's your experience with on the wear away for stall development? I should have mentioned this. The stalling characteristics because of the wedges there are very benign. Um, and, and I'll actually talk a little bit about uh, a handling aspect that I should have covered before that is interesting uh, and leads me to believe that there, there could have been a cause of a lot of the accidents. With the wedges there, it's it, it pretty much makes the airplane stall in a very benign fashion without dropping a wing uh, too badly at all. And if you're unbalanced in these airplanes, all the QFIs will tell you that pro probably lead to a, a wing drop. Uh, but in normal circumstances, when you're practicing stalls and training in the stalls, it is an easy aircraft uh, to recover the stall and it's a simple, straightforward stall. The thing that concerns me or that, that I tend to think uh, it could have been the cause of a lot of uh, accidents is, we mentioned flying in the circuit downwind, and this could apply to a lot of other um, situations where you are flying an aeroplane, uh, where you're trying to maneuver it tightly, either getting away from an enemy or particularly at low level. We would go downwind at about uh, 120 knots to begin with, power back, Below 105 knots, we're starting to take some flat. So you've got to decelerate from 120 to 105. So your power is going to be back a little bit. Now, if a young guy or anybody gets distracted during that deceleration phase, well, particularly while you're busy organizing all the levers and pulleys and bell cranks and hydraulic levers, uh, then the airplane's slowing down. As soon as you put that flat down, if you are not straight away onto the power to match that drag, then the airplane will continue to decelerate and it will decelerate fairly quickly. Even with the window open, 
with the cockpit window open, there is no discernible change in the airflow. So it doesn't sound like you're slowing down from uh, originally 120. And before you know it, you can be doing 70 knots. Now the airplane is going to stall at, at say 54. So you're not too far above the stall and that's with wings level. So all you need to do then is tip the lift vector into a base turn or maneuver tightly in whatever the situation demands and you immediately have a stall and you have a wing low. So then you've got a lot of trouble. So I suspect that that, that that phase of flight during those early days was the cause of a lot of accidents. Yes, my next question. And the wind shield, similarly, yeah. And they also had to move the tail on the wind shield, as you probably know. Uh, thanks, Ross, uh, for that. Um, when the SNJ and the Wurraway started up in that video, my eyes might have been playing tricks, but I thought the propellers uh, rotated in opposite directions. Did I see that correctly? Uh, no, you didn't. Right. Okay. No, that, that, that's just, just the way videos work uh, because okay. they're yes. looking at a certain a number of frames per right. second. And if you've got the rotation it's uh, the old stage out of sync with, the, with that. Yeah. So they're both Pratt & Whitney engines. They're the same engine. Right. And they always rotate clockwise as the pilot looks at it. Sure. Uh, the other question, very quickly, uh, did all Wurraways have the radio mast? I noticed that yours doesn't. No, uh, they didn't. And the early marks did. Uh, and the, the, the changeover point I'm not familiar with, but it's one of the many, many, many details that uh, some people will know about that, but that there would have been a changeover point. Uh, because not only were there were several marks, within each mark, there were several uh, uh, changes in design. For instance, mark threes, the later ones had strengthened uh, wing spars because they initially intended to fit dive brakes to them to be dive bombers. Uh, it wasn't a successful thing. A few of them were made, but still the, uh, the later model aircraft have got a higher top speed than the, the early ones because of the strength and wind. But I could not imagine, uh, our, our V and E is over 300 knots. I could not imagine doing 300 knots in a wheelway. <laughs> I've, I've done 250 and that was that was enough <laughs> yes Ewan thanks Eric I noticed under the cowl of several of the aircraft one appeared to have a single cooler of some description and some had two underneath the the cowl of the radial what what were they for uh, there was a single one on some of the earlier ones, and then there seemed to be another one oh, um, below and behind it. Uh, I can't answer that because the only ones I've seen are the, the ones with a single. That's the oil cooler air intake. Yeah. So what the second one is, I, I don't know. I'm sorry. The, the, uh, I Can I, uh, the earlier models had that style, that, that flat yeah. entry, and then the later ones came out with their bowl and they tipped up. Entry, yeah. entry mouth so but the reason for it i don't know okay. yeah i i reckon that's one of the least attractive <laughs> things about a wear away that uh, that bowl looking uh, air intake and you'll find that it's not on any of the t6s and the other variants excuse me Jazz. that was excellent um presentation ross and very interesting just one question the range and the endurance of the wear away? Uh, well, that would depend on who's paying for the fuel. <laughs> <laughs> I would say in round numbers uh, that you, you can get 500 miles out of it as range, uh, which is pretty good, but you'd have to be flying at a, an, a, at a max range sort of speed, which is not a military cruise uh, and an endurance the, it, the aircraft has uh, 360 litres, and if you said 60 litres for reserve, that's 300 usable litres, and it uses about 100 litres an hour. So you could get, uh, um, and that's the best you'll get, so you can get a good three hours with uh, uh, some reserves there on a fine day. And at 120 knots, you do the sums, and it could come out to just on 500 miles. Okay, any questions from uh, people at home? Lyrics made a comment up there. Did you hear it? Intake. 
into the tail. You want to read that out? Oh, uh, yeah, one, and one's for car, cold carburetor air. Mm, yeah, in okay. fact, the, the, early, the early models only had a single intake and both the cold carburetor air and the oil cooler came in the same intake. Whereas the later models, they split it into two air intakes. And if anyone would know, it would be Derek. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Derek. Any more questions from here? Any more questions from? Questions from the Zoom audience? Rags, nothing from you? No, surprisingly enough, Ross, you've covered everything. <laughs> Hi, it's David. <laughs> it's David Fredericks here from Canberra. And I was just going to make a point. You talked about A2103 and the Archer's aircraft that shot down the Oscar. Um, Air Vice Marshal Alan Reid, in his autobiography, wrote that in March 1954, when he was doing his pilot training, he actually flew A2103. And it was only many years later that he actually realised that he actually flew an aircraft that had that kill. Mm. So the aircraft was still flying around in 1954. That's when I started to fly around. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. Thanks for that. Uh, anybody else? Any questions? Hmm. I got one last one. Yeah, I was going to say. You've been flying Wiraways for a long time. Yeah. Might you be one of the pilots in Australia who's got more Wiraway time than anybody else? Well, I'd say I am the most experienced current Wiraway pilot. And I got, you know, with 500 hours, you know, when you, when you do an adventure flight in this thing at uh, 20 minutes, 30 minutes maybe, and you do an air display of uh, seven minutes. Yeah. So it takes a while to get that. But that's 25 years worth of um, challenges. Yes. Certainly World War II, if we were, if we were instructors on them, especially would have been logging up the hours in those days. Yep. Well, I think that will wind it up. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. I mean, thank you. Thank you.